Well, uh, my topic this morning is uh, whose land, a biblical appraisal. Uh, if you want more detail about the Arab-Israeli conflict, I actually did bring books, of, uh, copies of the book I wrote that they're available there. I'll be signing them. I also have a new book out, but uh, I figured this is more uh, related to what we're talking about, more germane to our topic. This is called Understanding the Arab-Israeli Conflict, What the Headlines Haven't Told You. If you are interesting, interested in looking beyond the headlines to what the Bible has to say, uh, this is a book that you might enjoy, so I brought that along. Uh, you know, land conflicts are common in the world today. There's a dispute between India and Pakistan regarding Kashmir. There's a dispute with the Russians and the Chechnyans. There's disputes between the Kurds and the Iraqis and the Kurds and the Turks. The idea of land disputes are not unusual, and so we shouldn't be surprised that there is a land dispute between the Arab world and the Israelis, uh, particularly today as seen in the dispute between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It's, it's not unusual, and so often we want to run right to the newspaper to get our answer for what to do about these land disputes, when in point of fact I think we need to be going to the Scriptures. Now there's, there's all sorts of issues involved with this. Uh, all of us need to actually look at this question from a biblical perspective and then bring the other issues to bear, whether it's historical, political, uh, geopolitical. We start with the Bible. And so that's what I, I really want to do is just start with a uh, sort of a biblical appraisal to this question of who does this land belong to. Now I want to offer five propositions that will help us understand this question which has caused about six or seven wars in the last century. Uh, it's a big dispute. These are the propositions that I want to begin with, okay? Uh, these five I think will give us some guidance. Now here's the first one. God promised the land of Israel to the Jewish people. I think when we go to the Scriptures, that's what we see. Now, when you start in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis starts with creation. And then, after creation, then you've got the primeval world, and then in chapter 12, God gives the land of Israel to Abraham. And he reiterates that promise over and over, and we'll look at some of those promises. The great Jewish interpreter from the Middle Ages, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, Rashi, he asked the question, why does God start with creation? And the answer he gives is that God gave, created the whole world, and as the creator, he establishes his right to give the land that he created to whomever he wishes. And so the, he sees the creation narrative as the establishment of God's authority to give the land of Israel to Abraham and his descendants. That's why creation is even in the story, because it gives God the right to do what he does. Now, so we see, because as creator, what he does is he promises the land to Abraham. We're going to look at these in depth in a minute. He promises the land to Isaac. He promises the land to Jacob, and he promises the land to Israel. So let's look at these. First, the promise to Abraham. He gives an unconditional promise to Abraham. It says in Genesis 12, the first statement of the Abrahamic covenant, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. It says in Genesis 13, 15, for all the land which you see I will give it to you and your descendants forever. It says in Genesis 15, 18, on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. It says in Genesis 17, 8, I will, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Now what you see here is repetition. Uh, I teach Bible study methods. And one of the things that I do at school is say, when you see something repeated, it means God wants to make a point. And some people have argued that the reason that the Abrahamic covenant 
is repeated in the, the Pentateuch is because there's different authors of different texts. There's the J, the E, the D, and the P, and whoever finally put this together was sewing it together, and he didn't know that he had already had it in there, so... Well, I kind of think Moses wrote this. I really do think it. And he wrote it with repetition so that the readers would understand what God's point is. He gave the land to Abraham and his descendants. That's an unconditional promise. He gave this promise to Isaac. It says, the Lord appeared to him, Isaac, and said, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of your sojournings, in the land which I, will sh uh, which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. So God takes this uh, promise that he made to Abraham, and he reiterates it to Isaac. Not to Ishmael, but to Isaac. And then... He takes that same promise that he made to Abraham and to Isaac, and he takes the unconditional promise of land, and he gives it to Jacob. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and your descendants. So he reiterates this promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible, he keeps making this promise, and I'm going to just go, there's another reference to it in Genesis 35, the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, Jacob, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Okay? He takes all these promises throughout the, the Pentateuch, reiterates them through the Scriptures, and I just want to go to a couple of passages in First and Second Chronicles where he says this to Israel. What he says to Israel is the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, he also confirmed it to Jacob for a promise, for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. And he says this again in Second Chronicles. In a prayer, it's reiterated, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not the God in the heavens? Are you, and are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? Now, oh, I can't walk around, sorry. Used to Here's the thing to remember about this, is that the Bible starts, the Hebrew Bible starts in Genesis. According to the uh, Jewish canonical order, the last books of the Hebrew Bible are First and Second Chronicles. So I've actually chosen these verses very deliberately. I started in Genesis... And I went to First and Second Chronicles, and I am uh, asking you to trust me that you can find these promises reiterated everywhere between Genesis and Second Chronicles. And what I'm trying to say is from the first of the book to the end of the book and everything in the middle, there's a consistent promise that God gave this land to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants forever. Now recently, I was uh, speaking with someone uh, sort of in a more formal setting, we were disagreeing about this. And his response is, the land isn't, was not given by God to Israel. The land belongs to God. And to say that the land belongs to the Jewish people would be to deny that the land belongs to God. Now, I just want to say really clearly, I think that the land belongs to God. But as Jeremiah later on says, he gives it to whomever he wills. And he has the authority to give the land to Israel, and that's what he did. Now, certainly it was Israel's responsibility to use it properly, to honor him with it, but nevertheless, the title deed that God gave, he wrote it to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants and said, this land belongs to the Jewish people. Okay? The God of Israel gave the land of Israel to the people of Israel. Now, the next question is, what land are we talking about? 
God also defined the boundaries of the land of Israel. He says it's from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. That's Genesis 15, 18. From the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Now, where is that? This is what the ancient Near East looks like. When we think of the river of Egypt, we generally think of the Nile River. But I don't think that's what the river of Egypt is. If you head across the, the, the northern part of the, the land of Egypt, across there but where the Mediterranean Sea is, and start making that turn where it heads north. I don't know if you can see it. Right about over there, there's a wadi, a dry riverbed. It only has water in the wintertime. It's called the Wadi El Arish. And that river was called the River of Egypt. That's where it was thought that Egypt actually began. <clears throat> Excuse me, began. The Wadi El Arish is not far, if you look just a little south, right there for where that little wadi is, there's a place called Kadesh Barnea. Do you remember where Kadesh Barnea was? It was the place where the, the spies went into the land of Israel to examine and see uh, where the land was, to spy out the land. Now, the reason I think that that's significant, it's by the Wadi El Arish. It's a direct line from it. If they were if the Nile River constituted the river of Egypt, they would have been in the land of Israel already. But they were still considered to be in the wilderness. They were not in the land when they're in Kadesh Barnea. And then they enter into the land of Israel as they pass the Wadi El Arish to examine the land. So it seems to me that it's best to see the river of Egypt as the Wadi El Arish, or uh, this, this river that runs down to Kadesh Barnea. And it extends all the way to the river Euphrates. Now that encompasses Lebanon, Syria, and parts of Iraq. That's a pretty big land grant. That is the definition that God has as to where the land of Israel is. From the river of Egypt, all straight north and a little northeast, basically much of the Fertile Crescent was the land that God promised Abraham. That's pretty impressive, don't you think? Now, I just want to say, I don't believe that Israel should enter into any war of liberation right now. I don't think Israel needs to take Syria and Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, but I'm just saying that one day, when the land grant is completely fulfilled, it will be fulfilled all the way up into the Fertile Crescent uh, following the Fertile Crescent and into Iraq, what is modern-day Iraq, and encompass Syria. That's where the land grant will be fulfilled. That's God's boundaries of the land of Israel one day. That's actually even bigger than the British mandate was in 1917, 1920. Now, third proposition. God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people as an eternal inheritance. When the Bible speaks of the gift of land and it specifies the boundaries, the Bible says that this land grant is forever. It is an eternal inheritance. And uh, we see that the verses that we already looked at in Genesis 13, 15, it says, I will give you this land and to your descendants forever. It says the same thing in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, that God gave this land to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants forever. Now, the word forever in Hebrew is le'olam. Le'olam means forever, unless it doesn't. It really means for the lifespan. That's what the word means, for its lifespan. For example, uh, in Exodus 20, where it speaks about, uh, Exodus 21, where it speaks about a slave. And the slave decides he doesn't want to be set free after seven years, but he rather wants to stay with his master forever. It says, and guys will like this because here's a male slave, and what is he going to do? He's going to pierce his ear. So they were very trendy back then. And I just want to say, guys, when I see those ear piercings, I always think, you must be a slave. Because what the person decides to do is have their ear pier pierced, and then they become a slave to their master, and it says... Le olam. 
forever. Well, obviously, it doesn't mean that for all eternity, after that person dies, that he remains a slave on into forever. What it means is for the lifespan of that slave. People have launched on this and said, well, you see, the land of Israel was God's gift to the people of Israel for the lifespan of that promise. And when Israel broke their part of the promise, their part of the covenant, God took that land and said, okay, forever is over. The lifespan is over. The promise is over. It's been given to others. So although the Bible is pretty clear that it says it's Israel's inheritance forever, forever may just mean till it was over. Well, the Bible says something else. It says that it is Israel's inheritance forever and ever. It's a Hebrew phrase, min olam va'ad olam. You've seen this in your Bible. Sometimes it's translated from everlasting unto everlasting. You've seen the phrase, it sometimes says forever and ever. It's in your Bible. That's the Hebrew phrase, min olam va'ad olam. Now, this is a very interesting phrase because it is regularly used of the character of God, the nature of God, who God is. Let me give you some examples of that. It says, and there's a bunch of verses, that the praise of God is from everlasting unto everlasting or forever and ever. And I've listed the verses there. If you want me to go slower, buy the book. Uh, <laughs> the Bible also says that the mercy of God is min olam va'ad olam, forever and ever. The Bible says the existence of God is min olam va'ad olam, from everlasting unto everlasting. And the Bible says in Daniel 7, 18, you can barely see it, but the Bible says, Daniel 17, that the kingdom of God is from everlasting unto everlasting, min olam va'ad olam. Now what's significant about this? It is the strongest Hebrew phrase for eternality. When the authors of the Hebrew Bible wanted to express the eternal nature of our God, they did it by using this phrase. It is the strongest way in Hebrew to convey the everlasting nature of God. And in fact, this is a phrase that is uniquely used of the nature of God. It is a special phrase that gen generally only is used of God whether it's his uh, praise, his mercy, his existence, or his kingdom. It is about God, but there's one exception. The one exception is this. It is not only regularly used of the character of God, it is also used of God's gift of the land to Israel. That's the only other place it's used, that same phrase, Min olam va'ad olam. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 7, this is what God says. I will allow you to live in this place, the land I gave to your ancestors, min olam va'ad olam. And in Jeremiah 25, 5, it says, Live in the land the Lord gave to you and your ancestors, min olam va'ad olam. The strongest way the writer, writers in Scripture could convey an eternality, a foreverness, an a unbreakable, unshakable, eternal nature of something is with this phrase. And it's used really about God. And the one exception is when it speaks about the eternal God's land grant to his people. And so I feel very confident saying that the God of Israel gave the land of Israel to the people of Israel forever, from everlasting unto everlasting. So we've got that God promised the land of Israel to the Jewish people. He set the boundaries of that land, and he made it an eternal inheritance. There's one other point to be made, or two other points. Here's the fourth one. Ready? 
God made absolute possession of the land of Israel contingent on Israel's faithfulness. Absolute possession of the land is contingent on Israel's faithfulness. God made it really clear that Israel could be expelled for disobedience. In the book of Leviticus, God says to Israel the following, and it's one of the saddest passages of Scripture that you'll ever read when you read Leviticus 26. It says this in verse 27 and following. In spite of this, you do not obey me, but act, and if in spite of this, you do not obey me, but act with hostility toward me, I will act with hostility toward you. I will discipline you seven times for your sins. You will eat the flesh of your sons. You will eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places and cut down your incense ulcers and heap your dead bodies on the lifeless bodies of your idols. I will reject you. That means temporarily. I will reduce your cities to ruins and devastate your sanctuaries. I will not smell the pleasing aroma of your sacrifices. I will also devastate the land so that your enemies who come to live there will be appalled by it. But I will scatter you among the nations, and I will draw a sword to chase after you. So your land will become desolate, and your city will become ruins. God says, if you disobey this Torah that I've given you, if you disobey the laws, I am going to discipline you. And the ultimate discipline is that you will be driven from this land, this wonderful gift I've given you, the land of milk and honey. And instead of it being a land of milk and honey, it will become a desolation. God's very clear. That's what he says. But he also makes a promise. He says God will be faithful in his promise regardless of Israel's behavior. If you skip down to verses 44 and 45, he says, Yet, in spite of this, while they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject or abandon them so as to destroy them and break my covenant with them, since I am the Lord their God. For, my, for their sake, I will remember the covenant with their fathers. Remember the covenant? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God, I am the Lord. Here's what God's saying. I will discipline you and scatter you. And that's a, a pretty clear theme in Scripture. I mean, it starts with Adam and Eve. God says, here, I'm putting you in a beautiful land, the Garden of Eden. Got wonderful trees. I've given you a law. Don't eat from one tree. What happens when they disobey that? Okay, everybody, out of the pool, you know. Got to leave. Cast out, right? That's how the Torah starts. And then God gives that wonderful land to the Jewish people. He says, you must obey this Torah. And then what happened when Israel disobeyed? Well, over a 490-year period, they didn't have the sabbatical year. They disobeyed the, the law. They worshiped idols. God finally allowed the Babylonians to come in and drive the Jewish people from their land. But that did not end the promise. He said, I will remember the covenant that I made. And what does he do? Seventy years later, he brings them back. And as soon as they are brought back, the, land, the land's title reverts to the true owners. The title of the land never actually changed. They, the people of Israel were in Babylon. They were expelled. But the land still belonged to them. And when they came back, it was their land. And although there has been a Jewish presence in the land of Israel ever since then, really, after the Roman conquest, first of uh, Jerusalem in, in 70, that one, and then in 135, after that time, Jewish people stayed in the land, mostly in Galilee, but then they began to scatter all over the world even further. So that the Jewish people were, a, though a presence, a very small minority in the land of their promise. But God never changed the land grant. He never took away the title. I've heard people say, wait, Jewish people can't have this land back until they believe. Well, think about it. When the Jewish people came back in the year 539 under Cyrus the Great, when the Babylonian exile ended, they came back. Were they faithful then? Were they believing then? No. 
In fact, I've been just uh, working in the book of Zechariah, and they come in Zechariah uh, 7, and they ask Zechariah, well, we're back in the land, and we're starting to offer sacrifices here on the Temple Mount, so uh, I guess the fulfillment's here, huh? We've got everything that God promised. And Zechariah says, no, no, you guys are just as bad as your fathers, and you're going to be driven from the land again. But God will bring you back. The point of this is, every time God allows in His providence the Jewish people to come back to the land, it's their land. He never takes away the title. He only takes them out of the land, and when He brings them back, it is still their land. That's the point of this. So, absolute possession of the land is contingent on Israel's faithfulness, and I have to say, that won't happen until the Messiah returns to Israel, when they finally look in faith upon Him, the one who was pierced, and mourn in repentance and turn their lives over to Him. Until all Israel does that, these promises won't be absolutely fulfilled. But every time Israel is in the land, it's their land because, because God's sovereign promise never took away the title. Okay, so God made absolute possession of the land of Israel contingent on Israel's faithfulness. But Israel's ownership or title to the land, that title is unconditional. Now, one last proposition. God assures that His promises to Israel are irrevocable regardless of unbelief in the Messiah. I hear this a lot. Well, the Jewish people are unbelieving. I hear this quite a bit, actually. Uh, and so, therefore, they've lost the land even if they're in the land. They don't believe in the Messiah, so they have no right to the land. And I always wonder about that. You know, 97% of Palestinian Arabs are Muslim. The other 3% are Christian, of which many are nominal Christians. I'm not sure if they really have a biblical understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. But many of them do, but of the 3%, but not all of them. 97% are Muslim. It is amazing to me that people would think that they have a greater right to the land despite their unbelief, even though Israel is an unbelief. Now, Israel is an unbelief, but God makes some specific promises to Israel even in unbelief, and that is that the promises He made to them, even in unbelief, are irrevocable. In Romans chapter 9, verses 3 through 5, God gave Israel unconditional blessings. They are unconditional. They are not something that will be taken away. Now, it starts in uh, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Paul talks about his great burden for his own people, that, uh, that he would like for them to… He, he, was wish, he was willing to himself spend eternity lost away from his Messiah if he would see his own people Israel come to know him. That's how passionate and burdened he was for his own people. But then after he says this, he says that, that he could wish himself accursed and cut off for the Messiah, from the Messiah for the benefit of my brothers, my countrymen, so he's talking about the Jewish people, by physical descent, they are Israelites. And then with present tenses, the Greek, he doesn't say this used to be theirs, past tense, but he is talking about their present condition. To them belong, and the emphasis would be presently, the adoption as sons of God, the glory the covenants, including the land covenant, the land aspect of the Abrahamic covenant, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. The forefathers are theirs, and from them, by physical descent, came the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. Here's the point he's making. All those blessings still belong to Israel in the present tense, even in unbelief. We know he's talking about Israel in unbelief because what has he said? He wishes that they would come to faith. He'd be willing to go to hell himself if they would accept heaven. 
But even so, in unbelief, all these blessings presently belong to the Jewish people, and that includes the unconditional promises of land. Second verse, uh, by the way, Romans 11, 1 speaks about how God has not rejected His people, and the proof of that is that there's a present remnant today. But in speaking about unbelieving Israel, this is what he says. Regarding the gospel, regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. He is saying that for the most part, the, the Jewish people who are not the remnant, these Jewish people who have rejected the Messiah, for the most part, most Jewish people do not believe. I mean, there are more Messianic Jews today than probably ever was. But nevertheless, the vast majority of Jewish people have not accepted Him. They remain enemies of the gospel. Not enemies of Christians. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Uh, Jewish people, very, very open-minded and tolerant. They just don't want to believe in Jesus themselves. But they're enemies of the gospel in the sense that they reject it. But then he says, but regarding election, chosenness, they are loved because of the forefathers. God still loves the Jewish people, even in unbelief, because of the promises that he made to the forefathers. Since God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. God, the New American says, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts that God made to the Jewish people that are described in Romans 9, including the land covenant, this is irrevocable. God will never take it away. And we had better be happy about that. Here's why. When we read Romans 9 through 11, it follows Romans 8. And Romans 8 ends this way. It says, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. And you could just see the unseen objector in, uh, in the book of Romans. There's this guy that's always saying, oh, yeah, Paul? And then Paul answers him. And you could just see him saying, yeah, what about Israel? God's rejected them. And Paul goes on to explain God's relationship with unbelieving Israel, and he promises that one day Israel will believe. But till then, God's promises remain true to his people. So even in their disobedience, he will not break his promises to his people. And that's so important for us because uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but I disobey and you disobey sometimes. And if that could make God separate his love from us, we'd all be lost. But nevertheless, God says, here's the way I, Paul says, this is how I explain the situation with Israel. God is faithful to his promise even when they are not. And the same is true for us. So we had better believe that. Now, God assures, therefore, that his gifts and his blessings are irrevocable despite unbelief. He will keep his promises to Israel. Okay? Those are the five propositions that I wanted to make. Okay? Now, here's the really important question. So what? So what? Uh, now, I want to say this as carefully as I can. I want to make it really plain. Okay? The first so what is the Palestinians do not have any biblical claim to the land of Israel. No biblical claim. I'm being very careful in what I say. No biblical claim. I'm not talking about history. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not saying that this is uh, anything that would give Israel a right to do wrong to Palestinians. I'm not saying that at all. But when it comes down to the question of who has a biblical right to the land, the land belongs to Israel. The God of Israel gave the land of Israel to the people of Israel forever. That's been my point. And so, I am not in any way endorsing any mistreatment of Palestinians, although I have to say this, I think that many of the, the stories that we hear of mistreatment of Palestinians, uh, I think I would put the blame more at the leadership of the Palestinians who have never failed to miss an opportunity. You know, Abba Ibn said, the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. They've had tons of opportunities to, to uh, have good circumstances, but their leaders, by having an absolutist approach of wanting all of Israel, have really missed out. But 
In terms of biblical claims, that's it. Now, even the question of Palestine, Syria Palestina is a name that the Romans gave to the land in the second century to get rid of its Jewish nature. And uh, so to make it not seem so Jewish, they renamed the land Syria Palestina. It's never used in the Bible. Even in the New Testament, it's called the land of Israel. Recently, I, I participated in a project, uh, the Holman Study Bible. I did study notes in it, in the book of Daniel. And uh, of course, it just came out last week, and so I wanted to see it. And I looked at the list of contributors, and they spelled my name wrong. <laughs> but it's very small, so it doesn't matter. But anyway, the, and so I, I uh, mentioned it to one of the editors there, and uh, I got a letter of apology from the final managing editor of the project, and he was just like so aggrieved, and I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, uh, please forgive me, and it's like, it's like, like no big deal. Uh, but I wrote him back, and I said, but you've got something else wrong. You've got another name wrong in the, in the Bible. And he was really surprised. He says, whose name? I said, the land of Israel. Look at the maps. All the maps say Palestine in the time of Jesus. Palestine in the in different eras. I said the land at those times in the biblical period were not, it was not called Palestine. That comes from the Philistines. It was Israel. Even in the New Testament, I gave him a whole list of references in the New Testament where the land of Israel is called the land of Israel. And he said, wrote me back, he says, oops, we'll fix that too in the next edition. So all the maps, that's a really a good thing that the maps are going to be fixed. Uh, in the next edition, because usually my wife, Eva, she has to cut out a piece of paper, you know, type on a piece of paper, Israel, and then she cuts it out and she pastes it over the maps in her Bible. She says, don't you want me to do it for you? I said, no, no, I can live with it. It's okay. But so the next edition she'll buy. But the point is, this is the biblical land of Israel. And, uh, it's important that we remember that. Secondly, the entire land of Israel is the inalienable possession of the Jewish people. It's the inalienable possession of the Jewish people. Uh, there's something that's going on, like for example, in the year 2000 when Yasser Arafat and uh, Ehud Barak met together at Camp David and President Clinton was trying to uh, offer bridging proposals to make a resolution of this conflict. One of the things that happened as they were discussing Jerusalem, and th this is in a uh, New York Review of Books article uh, by one of the negotiators there, he said that the president kept saying that we have to find a compromise on the Temple Mount because it's sacred to both faiths. And Arafat insisted that the Temple Mount uh, which that's not what he calls it, but he said that is not sacred to the Jewish people. He went on to say that there never was a temple on that mountain, neither a second or a first temple, no Solomonic temple, no Herod's temple, nothing, that that was always just a mosque and there never was a temple there. Well, that, that should be an affront to Christians, don't you think? Because, I mean, we believe the New Testament. Well, nevertheless, he insisted that the Jewish temple was someplace in Samaria. President Clinton said, well, I just have to tell you, I believe that that was a Jewish temple. At which point the State Department minder leaned over and whispered in his ear. And then President Clinton said, well, I have to make it really clear, that is my personal opinion. It is not the official position of the United States of America. So the United States of America does not acknowledge that there ever was a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, uh, but President Clinton believed it, so that's good. It's personal opinion. Here's my point. There is an attempt to delegitimize the ancient possession and, and uh, 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 dwelling in the land of Israel by Jewish people. Even today, many Christians who do not see these promises to Israel as still continuing will argue, and, and recently a number of articles have been, come out, where Palestinians say, we are the, the Palestinian Christians say, we are the first descendants, the, the continuing descendants of the uh, 
the first Christians. We are the descendants of the first Christians. And therefore, the land belongs to us. And they even go on to say that Jesus was the very first Palestinian, and he should not be identified as a Jew because, you know, he was oppressed like we are. Now, listen, the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. The God of Israel gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people, to the people of Israel forever. It is their inalienable possession, and we should be very careful to, uh, of, uh, not to allow Muslims or Christians to take that inalienable possession away. Thirdly, until the Messiah establishes his kingdom, which is hopefully soon, every time I hear Joel speak, I think it's maybe a little sooner than I thought. <laughs> but until that kingdom is established, Israel may negotiate the boundaries of the land of Israel. Remember when I showed you that map and I said, I don't believe Israel should be indulging in any war of liberation of Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq? If they can say, you know what, we will wait until the Messianic kingdom to have the full grant of land that God has given us, I think Israel can wait and negotiate land. Now the problem is that there's a, a fear that there is no one to negotiate with, that there's the difficulty and the fear of granting, giving up land in exchange for a piece of paper. I, I'm not smart enough to solve those issues. But when Christians say Israel should not even negotiate a settlement with the Palestinians, I think it's short-sighted. That we have to have the far sight. That one day, the God of Israel will give the people of Israel all the land of Israel. But that's not yet. Let me just end with this. Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was one of the great Jewish scholars, wrote this after the birth of the State of Israel. Any attempt to sever the vital link between Israel the people and Israel the land is an affront to biblical faith. Worshiping the golden calf was forgiven, but the slander of the ten spies was not. The entire generation which left Egypt died in the wilderness the Holy One, blessed be He, could forgo His own honor, but could not forgive the transgression of slandering the promised land. May we be as committed to that land and God's gift to it as God Himself is. Let's pray. Father, thank You that You are gracious in Your gifts, more gracious than we ever dreamed possible, giving us the great gift of the Lord Jesus. And Father, thank you that you have been so gracious to your people in giving this land to them and bringing them back there. Lord, I pray for Israel that you'd give them wisdom in negotiating with the Palestinians. I pray for the Palestinians that they would uh, experience your peace and uh, experience your presence in their lives and that many would come to faith in Yeshua. Lord, I pray that they would find, uh, uh, even if it's just temporal, until the end of days, until the return of Messiah, that they might find a sense of peace in that land. And, uh, and democracy and, and freedom and, and uh, justice. And Lord, I just commit them into your hands. But Father, I pray that you would do your will in working out all these details. It just seems that we are in those days where this will ultimately culminate. But we don't know. Until that day, Lord, we pray that we would be faithful to your word and, and true to your promises, uh, that we would stand with those promises. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen.